Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, The Impact of Precise Medicine on the Practice of Classical Pathology. What are some of the challenges and opportunities? I'm Brenda Kelly Kim of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking site for science professionals and provider of educational web seminars. For more information, please visit www.labroots.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. Questions can be submitted by clicking the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This is an educational web seminar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left hand corner of your web page and follow the process for obtaining your credits. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Michael J. Donovan. Dr. Donovan, PhD, MD, is a board certified anatomic and clinical pathologist with subspecialty boards in pediatric pathology. In addition to an academic career at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital, Dr. Donovan was in the biotechnology space for over 15 years. and has worked with a variety of companies, including Millennium Pharmaceuticals, Genentech, Insight, and most recently served as the Chief Scientific Officer for Orion Biosciences and the Chief Medical Officer of Exome Diagnostics. He spearheaded the utilization of multiplex tissue and fluid-based assays and coupled mathematic applications to produce clinically relevant diagnostic, predictive, and prognostic outcome models for a variety of tumor types and disease states. Dr. Donovan is currently the director of the biorepository at Sinai and is the director of the experimental pathology program across Mount Sinai. I will now turn it over to Dr. Donovan for his presentation. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Michael Donovan. I'm speaking today from uh, Mount Sinai and I'm going to be speaking about uh, translational precision pathology. So hopefully everyone can see the slides and we'll proceed. And uh, I think if you have any questions, you're able to submit those questions to me online. So everything hopefully will be fine. We'll see how it goes. So today will be a bit different than uh, probably past uh, presentations uh, on this particular topic because I'm focusing on the impact that uh, the clinical genomics age is having on pathology departments and uh, how this can be best managed through a variety of novel technologies and approaches that I think will be important to be able to redefine some of the attributes of phenotyping patients and, and making this a more effective process. So some of the agenda items that we'll cover today is reviewing personalized medicine and the challenges uh, that this has in affecting tumor interrogation and characterization, which is uh, critical, obviously, in pathology efforts. The era of what I call next-gen pathology department and what that will look like in the future and how we will, uh, as pathologists, meet those needs of the future. The impact of tumor heterogeneity on the entire diagnostic, prognostic, and predictive process and how uh, there are additional tools that can be brought to bear in the context of tumoral heterogeneity. 
the role of the liquid biopsy and just to touch upon what that is and some of the new technologies that are out there and how they can be deployed in the clinical setting and then some future programs that we'll be covering here at Mount Sinai, specifically surrounding the liquid biopsy piece. So as everyone I think understands that uh, medicine has always been personalized, we treat patients, we diagnose patients, but reading the disease phenotype has been somewhat challenging. And as this slide illustrates, uh, going from the organ system, brain, lung, bone, reproductive cycle, gastrointestinal GI tract, that uh, go, taking that through to the molecular side has been the challenge that we're all faced, I think, in terms of trying to really understand that phenotype, decipher what is happening at the biochemical physiologic level, and then impact on that in some way, specifically as it relates to the disease process at hand. So uh, quite a while ago now, in 2011, Doug Hanahan and Bob Weinberg had looked at the hallmarks of cancer as sort of the, I think, the pillars of what we are focusing on in pretty much all of our strategies in terms of understanding the proliferative cycle, evading uh, growth uh, suppressors, resisting cell death, uh, investigating angiogenesis, replicative immortality, and invasion and metastasis are some of the main characteristics that uh, we look at from a signaling pathway perspective and then all of the attributes that those play and what roles they actually can be incorporated in disease manifestation. And this has really driven a lot of the activities in uh, biology today and in clinical medicine with some specific attributes. And I'm going to try this little function here um, to look at uh, areas like genome, genome stability as one of those variables, as well as tumor promoting uh, inflammation. So as uh, I think everyone has uh, appreciated that genomic analysis has really driven some of the changes in terms of our phenotyping capabilities. And then most recently has been uh, the attack on the immune system and the checkpoint inhibitors and the role that they play. And our understanding of the infiltrate within disease processes has evolved over time. And that does have become significant components that I think we need to further understand and evaluate. Now, there have been some very important uh, elements that have driven a lot of our understanding of disease, especially at the cancer level. And the Cancer Genome Atlas is the next slide here illustrate some of these processes going from tissue source through the analysis aspect and then generating sequencing data that in combination with clinical data has driven some of our understanding of disease. As you can probably imagine, there are limitations in the approach itself, uh, that they are limited by the number of samples you have, they're limited by the types of samples that you will get in these processes, you're restricted in some degree by the clinical data that's associated with it. So those do present uh, barriers, but overall it has helped to collectively understand some of the tumor processes that are occurring within these individual tumor states. And that has uh, benefited quite a bit from a number of levels. And I think one particular aspect has been the ability to be able to share that data in a way that has allowed a number of folks to start investigating and interrogating tumor types and, and really building up a compendium that can be applied. And so it speaks to the tumor registry aspects that are occurring on at a number of companies and a number of institutions that I think will help to drive that. But there are limitations within the approach itself and you know, some of the data that has come out and published on even being able to create models that predict risk by looking just at clinical data can be very powerful, even more powerful than the actual genomic data that comes along with those attributes. So those become very important things to understand and, and how that actually can impact on where we are. I don't know if there's any questions yet, but I'll just, I just looked over just to see. So some of the key issues that we are facing is finding the hub gene target. Uh, as obviously, as many folks understand, really identifying that and uh, those uh, carrier or uh, the genes that are not really specific with regards to a, uh, an endpoint are also and can be mutated in those uh, analyses. And so really finding the hub gene target and being able to target that in a way therapeutically becomes a very significant uh, endpoint, in addition to not only targeting, but also to understanding uh, mechanisms of resistance and overall risk components. Deciphering the inherent clinical molecular heterogeneity of disease is, I think, a very important variable that is overlooked uh, in many cases with regards to the genomic aspects. And really having uh, the ability to do that on a genomic level from germline to somatic 
and then introducing the environmental pieces as well as the elements of the tissue itself become very important. Now there's a number of relevant phenotypes that have produced some false positives and so that's something that has to be mitigated as we approach these issues from a clinical genomic strategy and others and so it's it's ways to improve upon our abilities to statistically analyze these areas but also uh, create large enough cohort data that can actually be deployed effectively. The ability to look at multi-domain data elements is an important aspect that uh, we all face. Uh, the term big data has obviously been a, a somewhat abused over the years in terms of its uh, role and I think uh, those of us that were involved in the personalized medicine space when it first started also uh, feel the same issues that, have, that impacted personalized medicine in terms of the word have impacted on big data. But those are uh, things that we need to really address uh, to understand how to look at that data effectively. And then obviously the ability to prospectively validate in current drug programs uh, and clinical trials. And that's something that is quite challenging as uh, everyone on the phone and online probably understands that there needs to be motivation from the biopharmaceutical sector. And then it is a complex trial design which is not trivial to uh, produce. So as a pathologist, we are incumbent on the anatomy and the pathology to help drive our understanding of disease. We overlay that with something that we produced a while ago when I was with a company that uh, looked at uh, and tried to get at some of the elements that you could derive from the tissue and equate those to a molecular piece. And the microarray strategies that were uh, initiated quite a number of years ago, but uh, overlaying those on the human anatomy was a critical piece. But as uh, we all know, there are challenges with that entire context that I just went through. And from a pathology department perspective, there are a number of issues. We, you know, meeting clinical regulatory needs as an oversight of everything that happens in a clinical department drives some of the processes that will be developed in the technology research space. So there needs to be managed uh, programs at academic centers that can uh, incorporate internal research programs. We're attracting uh, appropriate human capital as well as NIH dollars and philanthropic support to maintain that. And pathology departments and academic centers are competing in a very demanding healthcare environment. And so we need to create a, a consultative information synthesizing clinical department that can drive that as opposed to the more traditional academic uh, pathology departments. And, and this gets to some of the challenges of us meeting that personalized medicine uh, space. And as you can tell, being a pathologist, I put the pathologist in the center of that entire process. <laughs> so the Department of Pathology new structure, I'll go through this um, rather quickly is to look at the traditional ways of service, uh, anatomic, AP, clinical pathology, CP, and then the molecular pathology in the center, sort of the interface between those two. So this is really the, the traditional uh, view of most departments of pathology. There is an educational research piece that's present there as well, and that is uh, involved with a number of ac activities that look at uh, students, resident fellows, and faculty monitoring element. But another element, uh, and I think uh, ad, uh, aspect of the next generation pathology of the future is really to have an experimental pathology element and component to it, which has both an intramural and an extramural piece. And what do I mean by that? So the, the intramural element is really driving activities, drawing upon the re vast and rich resource of information, clinical data, and the environment that we're in to be able to develop uh, both novel diagnostics, therapeutics, really be able to deploy a number of, uh, uh, from an investigational sense through appropriate IRB channels, the right studies that can actually start to create some informative information. Then the other piece is the extramural side, and that's bringing in novel technologies that are really just getting started or are fairly mature but have not met clinical rigor. And this puts them into an environment where they actually can be uh, understood and, and further analyzed. And that becomes a very important component, I think, of the next gen pathology department. And obviously with all of that is the IT, your, in, your institutional support for that computational power to be able to pull all that information together and use that effectively in modeling becomes a very critical aspect of this. And here we also overlay the institutional biorepository piece, which I believe is a, a, an element that is somewhat overlooked at most centers in terms of making it comprehensive. This is not just a fluid-based biorepository, but it is a tissue disease-specific, project-specific based biorepository that can drive that. And that's what we really push forward here to be able to deploy this in a way that is global across the Mount Sinai healthcare system, 
but then also pulls on various disease states. And this is not just tumor, but also other diseases, because there is quite a bit of intersect in the evolution of more uh, diseases that may have an end result, which is cancer, like inflammatory bowel disease and ulcerative colitis. So having mechanisms to understand that, dissect it, and then integrate that becomes an important element. And so we created a biorepository pathology core function, which helps us to understand those elements, as well as the molecular pathology piece. And those become integrated in a way where you can drive research and discovery efforts to clinical efforts. So functioning almost as a biotech in, within the context of a, an academic and next-gen clinical pathology department. So we have a variety of uh, technologies and services that we are able to provide, but we really, the investigational piece is to meet a variety of elements that are linked to a trial or a disease process or an understanding of that. So using a variety of uh, different types of formats of collection processes help us to begin to build those necessary banks. So it pulls back some of that tumor registry that I was speaking about with the TCGA, but doing that internally in a much more comprehensive way and in a much more real-time fashion as well. And then this is linked to a pathology core element, which functions in a capacity to be able to drive some of the analytic processes that will get at some of those functional identification and phenotyping of the individual genes and proteins that are coming out of the variety of disease states that are being put together by the repository. So you can see this becomes a very integrative uh, collective that drives some of these activities. Now molecular pathology is obviously has been a significant aspect of pathology departments and it is evolving as it must with regards to clinical genomics driving these activities, which is being uh, emphasized in a variety of efforts across the entire uh, healthcare system. So it enables us to be more precise in our diagnosis and classification. It provides prognostic information. It can define molecular targets for therapy or not, and allowing monitoring of therapeutic response, which is becoming more of an important aspect as we understand the targeted therapy and its limitations. Stratifying risk for disease development is an important component, as well as building in an informed genetic counseling piece, especially for the hereditary cancers and the pathogenic variants that become very important as we try to pull this process together. Now, of course, there are challenges with regards to this molecular pathology program. And over the years, this has been quite a traditional of doing, uh, in, some would even lump immunistic chemistry as a molecular pathology piece because you're looking at a protein and result of a molecular pathway. So that being said, you would have in situ hybridization as being part of these processes. This is sort of the, what has been done and still occurring with regards to various fish type analyses and translocations that become very important in the liquid tumors as well as in the solid malignancies most recently. And then overlaying that with a variety of activities has helped to drive some of the understanding of the genetic and genomic approaches that can be brought to bear on the disease process of interest. But with that have become, uh, I think, excellent success stories, obviously, for the HER2, ER, and PR as biomarkers that have been and evolved to the point of being quite successful in their approach. And I am limiting this somewhat to the solid tumors and not focusing on the hematologic malignancies here, just to uh, have folks understand. And as you can see, BRAD V600E and melanoma, EGFR, and e the activating mutations in EML4 ALK and lung cancer, now ROS, as well as EGFR, KRAS, and NRAS in colon, the uh, use of the Oncotype DX test for breast, colon, and prostate, as well as, and I put PSA here because it is currently used as a biomarker, it is a strategy that folks use to actually do an invasive procedure such as a biopsy. Uh, but is that really a success story is a challenge, obviously. And even with all of these, there are attributes that will not give you the complete story with regards to that patient. So you will get windows of opportunity with regards to the use of a therapeutic, but you must understand that there are both elements of that tumor heterogeneity that I mentioned and that heterogeneity at the molecular level as well as in then the response of the patient that impacts on these processes and it's important to really understand that. So most recently I think that we've all learned that precision oncology is evolving and uh, as I mentioned and hopefully you'll understand in the respective pathology departments evolving 
uh, genomics is evolving as well. And the past, uh, my, uh, you know, the use of imatinib and CML has, uh, you know, for driven, I think, uh, the variety of uh, activities that we all understand as being a wonderful, uh, perfect storm of smart scientists and that relatively simple cancer looking at a specific translocation and then getting a very effective drug with tremendously positive results. That's a, that was a, that's a huge success and I think that it's, it's not, uh, you know, in any way diminished in terms of where we're going. It's just gives you an idea of that you need that collective to really have that perfect storm and that success. It's very important to understand that not every activating and, and every mutation is an activating mutation and not all drugs that block protein function halt growth. And even though we would love to think that, it isn't really the reality that we face. And I think that that's becoming true. And the more we understand that, the more we'll, I think, drive home the true personalized care and that, that true effort of being able to impact on disease. The element of basket trials, has, as I think many are familiar with, this histology agnostic approach. Um, and that means finding just the mutation in various tumor types and then uh, treating patients with the drug for that specific mutation would be a huge success. And in, in some respects it is, but in others it is not. And colorectal cancer with the BRFE600 inhibitors has not been a tremendous success. And so it, it does lend pause to, for you to understand that even though we would love to just dismiss the histopathology piece and just go after it as a histology agnostic element, may not be the most appropriate thing to do in general in cross all tumor types. And so I think we have to be tumor specific there and, and rather than uh, histology agnostic. The recent Shiva trial uh, in last year by Lord Tonneau et al. I think was uh, an awakener for some of us, others not, because we believe that that was the case. This is the first randomized trial in precision oncology. So this is really looking at the role that uh, different therapeutics would be able to play by using off-label use of drugs uh, in that setting. And it, it really challenges some of the views that we would have in terms of the types of mutations that you would drive an understanding from versus the standard of care in chemotherapy and that it not is not always better. And I think we it does get to some of the various editorials surrounding the trial which were looking at uh, things like oligomutant versus polymutant cancers. And the polymutant cancers uh, may have an end R of a different phenotype and may be better served by uh, different types of targeted therapies, multimodal therapy, things like that. So it's, it's ways for us to understand the evolution that we're seeing with regards to both specific diseases as well as the types of therapies we, we apply. So I think we have some very you know, interesting uh, ways to look at some of these approaches. And certainly there have been true successes. And the evolution of cancer classification, especially in lung cancer, has driven and changed how we actually approach that disease. And I think molecular subtyping of that disease has been an important characteristic for therapeutic uh, indication. And it's, it has been quite significant. And on the next slide here, you'll see the role that the EGFR activating mutations has played with regards to specific drugs such as gefitinib in refractory lung cancer patients. And the dramatic responses that we see are a testimony to the understanding of the disease, the phenotype of the disease, and the molecular characteristics of that disease. And that becomes, a, I think, a very important element of what you try to accomplish when we approach these from a molecular pathology perspective. Now, obviously, getting this into the guidelines is important from a variety of perspectives. Um, I think it, it helps to sort of standardize the approach to management of patients, but it also lends credence and support to the aspects of these various mutations in specific disease states. And this just is the uh, NCCN guidelines for lung cancer and listing the various EGFR as well as KRAS and ALK uh, components that are required now uh, to be able to stratify patients and understand their response. Given that some of these are resistance mutations, such as T790M, and is that the best served through a tissue-based biopsy approach, or should those be really evaluated more from the liquid biopsy perspective and not uh, subjecting the patient to biopsies post-treatment? 
so this gets into some of the challenges that I think we face um, is in, as pathologists because I think we need to embrace these newer technologies because they will be driving the elements of how we play a central role in all of these activities. To that point, I think it's interesting to note that at least in prostate cancer, the role that the circulating tumor cell has played with regards to androgen receptor splice variants and the resistance mechanisms that those play with regards to uh, therapeutic uh, androgen signaling pathway inhibitors such as enzalutamide and abiraterone. And it's important to see that those were identified really in, in circulating tumor cells. Obviously, the splice variant ARV7 has become the significant one, and there are antibodies to this, and there are ways to understand it. But you know, these are post-treatment elements, and so they become very important in that liquid biopsy set, uh, space. And there's a number of methodologies that can be brought to bear on that, not just in the circulating tumor cell side, but I believe in exosomes as well uh, that help to uh, put forth some of those attributes and understanding, as well as the complexity with this. And although we focus on ARV7, there are many that believe that the splice variants themselves are collectively responsible for some of the mechanisms of resistance. So there's a lot happening in this area. I think it's uh, really an important aspect for us to understand as molecular pathologists, as next-gen pathologists, that we deploy and understand these various components as we manage our patients. You know, and I've been around a while to know that, you know, we all uh, did the grind and find approach and uh, function to really drive genomic and uh, transcriptomic understanding. And, you know, starting with the, that high content on the left-hand side of the screen here, which really, it's, it's interesting, and we don't have time to go into the specifics, but how we actually approach some of the, the analytes that we end up using in our final assays is quite interesting. And uh, it needs to be sort of understood that these will have limitations associated with them and that we are left to trust at the right side of the screen what is our readouts from these particular approaches. And so with that, I think there is a, a challenge to try to put this in the context of disease and the complexity of disease that we can always hope to be able to derive information from these uh, high content approaches, but our, our analytic approaches and our uh, ability to be able to integrate this data with other data streams becomes as important as the uh, technology itself. One significant aspect of this is really tumor heterogeneity, and I think that um, there have been very nice studies on this, um, and uh, we have published on it as well to start understanding tumoral heterogeneity at the uh, clonal genomic level, but also at the tissue level and the histology level and what that really means and how we can drive that and, and that understanding with respect to individual patients. So there are obviously individual molecular properties and subclones that are present within tumors and the importance of those uh, is dependent upon a variety of attributes. And that's where some of those resistance mechanisms that I alluded to, even with EGFR and T790M, or the resistance of ALK pathways become significant post-treatment because you may be removing some of these subclones and then it is the resistant clone that remains. So we really have to have a better understanding of what that means. And uh, now a few, quite a few years ago, we had established uh, an idea and a premise surrounding systems pathology which has evolved to precise pathology. And, and that really takes into consideration the intact tissue specimen and the attributes of that tissue specimen and the morphometry, the quantitative assessment of that becomes very important as an understanding of the variables that are associated with uh, disease. And I think dismissing that and just grinding that up is really a disservice to the biology and to the patient because I think that we're not gleaning as much information as we possibly could. So we created this as a methodology and linked it with a, a component of multiplex immunofluorescence strategies, which created quantitative features, and then used the clinical data that was available for those patients and integrated that with advanced um, mathematic techniques that are now, I think, becoming more uh, in vogue and understood that helps you to derive these accurate predictive and prognostic risk models. And so there's a number of uh, components of that that become important, but just to give you a sense of what that looks like if you did object-based morphometric image analysis on a biopsy from prostate cancer patient. 
And here you'll see in this image a uh, lot of color, and you'll see green uh, predominantly, and then you'll see gold. And the green uh, is reflective of cytokeratin positivity. So the, they're all cytokeratin positive, but the ones that are gold are actually a combination of race mace. This is a, an enzyme that's associated with the prostate cancer disease. So uh, components of it, a high-grade pin to prostate cancer, has an increased amount of race mace. And so you can see there's quite a bit of heterogeneity just in prostate cancer, which morphologically by H&E looks quite similar. But when you start getting down to the phenotype of it, it's quite different. And then that can be drilled down even further by looking at androgen receptor components. And the other colors there, the red, the blue, and the pink, are representative of the levels of androgen receptor that are present by immunofluorescence. And so you can see that some cells have very high levels of androgen receptor and some have very, very low to none. And that, that, dis, that differential becomes very important. And I'm not going into what's happening in the stroma, but the stroma itself also becomes very important in these processes. So the point being really to have an understanding of this becomes very critical in our view of disease and how we can actually deploy that. And hopefully you can see that if you take that and if you grind all that up, you will miss attributes of that particular phenotype. Now, some would argue that they may not be important attributes for that patient and that we would find something that's driving the disease process. That may be so for a period of time, but there's other elements there that will be missed. And uh, things like cancer stem cell activity and the presence of cancer stem cells and the load of cancer stem cells can become quite important. And this can be applied in a number of ways. And I think um, you can look at this, and we did studies not only just in prostate, but in uh, ovarian cancer using a multiplex with cytokeratins where you can create a mask and then you can start looking at the cell signaling uh, activity. And so in this case, we were looking at more oncogenic activity and looking for mutations in P53, as well as the presence of phosphorylated ERK in a pathway sense. And you can see just by, this is uh, looking at this in different colors, that uh, the cytokeratin image itself in cytokeratin 7 is identified with that magenta or pink color which is present again in this image here. But then P53, as you'll see, is in red. So there's a distribution of P53 mutant present within the ovarian cancer. And then the phosphorylated ERK is present in the nuclei and concentrated within the nucleus as well as in the membrane of some of the cells within the ovarian cancer, but not in all of them. So a, a subset are, actually have that activity. So it gets at some of that, again, that level of complexity, because you can derive those features quantitatively and then put them in models and see if there is importance and relevance. And this can be done simply even by looking and using morphometry and doing the H&E on a liver section, which is uh, seen in this image here. So this is from a study where you were looking at more of a, a toxicology with respect to impact on liver uh, attributes. And the H&E image itself, for the pathologist online, there's steatotic presence, so there's vacuoles which are present within the hepatocytes. You can segment that, segment that on a scale, so you can create a, a view of what the actual vacuoles look like. And then you can create a heat map of that, which is the last image, which looks at the degree of steatosis. So it, it gets to some of the liver injury, but it's putting that into a quantitative place as opposed to a subjective space, which is quite important as you move these processes forward. Now we're continuing to advance the, the aspect of understanding morphometry here in a precise pathology group at Mount Sinai. And this looks at ways to expand our view of how to decipher cancer, how to decipher histopathology by using Voronoi diagrams, which is some of the ways in which you could start constructing uh, assessment of gland structure, if you will, in an adenocarcinoma. And can't go into too much detail, but using these techniques, you're able to then look at degrees of differentiation or undifferentiation with respect to adenocarcinoma, for example, but other ways. And we recently uh, had an abstract at ASCO GU, and we've had others since then that have used the features that are present within this morphometry derived from these glands to start constructing models of outcome. And then if you overlay that with the androgen receptor expression profiles at the protein level, you can get some very different ways to start sorting out and understanding disease manifestation by combining morphometry, histopathology, and biomarker attributes. And that really is the essence of the precise pathology and systems pathology piece. 
So a lot of those efforts, I think, are driving yet another resurgence again in single cell sequencing data and understanding of how that looks. And there's been a further push to do this, and we have that ongoing here in a variety of disease states where to start looking at single cells and really getting at some of the tumoral heterogeneity piece and exploiting that further. Obviously very challenging with a, a number of uh, elements to it that are a little difficult to talk about in this session, but certainly something to think about as we move through the space that single cell sequencing is an important component. And in concert with that, I think we'll have an understanding of some of the elements where circulating tumor cells become an important part of that single cell research space, as well as the idea of the cancer stem cell theory and that, that uh, limited number of population of cells which are inherently chemo resistant and have the potential for driving disease post-treatment. And I think those are important elements to be understood that uh, will continue to evolve as we learn more about them. Now, technologies are picking up. With that, and when uh, I was at another company quite a few years ago, we used laser capture microdissection quite a bit to understand uh, individual and collections of cells in disease processes. This is looking at an atherosclerotic plaque, so not obviously cancer related, or we do send, some call this cancer of the vessels, is that it, uh, it allows you to, uh, with a technique that has now evolved to be quite robust and relatively standardized, you can uh, microdissect individual cell populations. You can use immunohistochemistry to identify the specific cell populations and isolate those. You can analyze them at the DNA level, the RNA level. So it really opens up that whole space of single cell sequencing. It opens up the whole space of understanding that in the context of disease and tumoral heterogeneity. And I think it will become and continue to be an important component. Now, as you heard me mention, the cancer stem cell uh, hypotheses that uh, Carlos Cardo and his group have continued to push forward. And they make compelling arguments of the presence of cancer stem cells that in this view here are cytokeratin negative cells. So it's a negative cell population, not differentiated cells that are present within tumors. In this case, this is prostate cancer, high grade prostate cancer. And then looking at these cells with uh, multiplex immunofluorescence strategies, you can start to see that there are components of the beta catenin pathway present. You can merge these, you can understand that cell population a little better. So that becomes a very interesting attribute and in that by looking at the numbers of those cells in different types of grades of Gleason cancer for prostate here, you'll see that they are very reflective of poor outcome with the higher the number of these cancer stem cells, suggesting that that tumor load that we speak about is not just a tumor load in general, but it's a tumor load with respect to the stem cell hypothesis. And I think that's an important element that uh, should be further evaluated and continue to be exploited. Now, switching gears a, lit to, a little bit to go towards the liquid biopsy applications and how those uh, are seen to play a role in these various activities. And, I think that the liquid biopsy space continues to evolve uh, from some of the early efforts which were pro focusing on circulating tumor cell biology and some of the systems that were deployed in classical departments of pathology and clinical laboratories to be able to quantify or enumerate the circulating tumor cell was an important aspect. But the liquid biopsy piece really is reflective of everything that's going on in fluids. So it's really just not restricted to your circulating tumor cell population. So you'll have circulating tumor cells, you'll have circulating cell-free DNA, which I think a lot of people online have heard about. Now there's whole meetings at Tricon about this, as well as the exosomes, uh, which are the multi uh, derived, uh, free-floating, but really intact plasma membrane vessels that are out in all fluid spaces that allow us to start understanding the roles that these uh, individual components play within uh, disease processes, cell-to-cell -cell communication, and really are a reflection of what's happening at the systemic level, which is something that is impossible to do, really, as I, we hope you understand, at the tissue level. But yet it is another variable that needs to be included in this whole process. And so there's a number of aspects here of the looking at various ways in which these types of activities can be understood. And I think uh, 
at the review of a therapeutic decision point where these types of approaches can be evaluated if you don't have enough tissue to be able to make a diagnosis, whether there is ALK present, let's say, or there are EGFR mutations present within a particular sample. If you're fine needle aspirate from a patient sample at the time of diagnosis with lung cancer, this becomes very critical because otherwise you will have no diagnostic material to make that decision. Correlating with tumor stage becomes very important uh, because you have another way to evaluate the level of dissemination of those cells within the body, and that's an important view. Evolution at different time points also becomes quite important. You'd like to know the, how the dynamics of the disease are progressing and, and what's happening post-treatment and during treatment. And then review of, obviously, tumor recurrence becomes very important as we further manage these patients. And how the, these will be deployed in various therapeutic and even novel therapies is still becoming, uh, I think, a, of even more significance as we try to understand checkpoint inhibitors and the role of pdl one status within tumors, all very important components. So as I was uh, alluding to, that microvesicle communication with exosomes has been well established in the literature. There's quite a number of publications on this from various independent groups that have validated the uh, methodology behind the use and utility of microvesicles the, one of the discrete, I think, and distinct advantages is the uh, aspect of RNA. And I think we sometimes overlook the RNA piece um, because of its complexity and its instability, but it, it does and represent a very significant aspect of where we need to be heading. And I think anything that helps us to get there with regards to whether it's in vitro diagnostics that look at RNA or other methodologies is important because that becomes a very a a relevant aspect of the disease phenotype. And there's this is a fairly complex slide, but it has and illustrates a number of these points, I think, that you can see of how these can be used at different elements or understood at different points in disease from the relevance for angiogenesis as well as the autocrine signaling to distant tumor cells. So that level of communication becomes a very important component. And another one I think is fast uh, advancing is really the use in immunosuppression and understanding that immune complex aspect becomes very critical. And there are additional technologies here from the peptidomic space uh, that will also be important to drive this understanding and developing these models. Uh, but it gives you the idea that the fluid space is quite complex but rich with data that we need to really understand. And in the essence of uh, the exosome biology piece, what we thought, you know, I started out as an electron microscopist. And so when we saw these on cells, it looked like junk on the cells, but they actually were budding vesicles that were actually derived from these multivesicular bodies as well as other processes that in first identified in GBM, which is the glioblastoma a multi form a microvesicles. And then using electron microscopy and various techniques, you can identify the size of the exosomes as well as you can then uh, dissect out the contents and get a very uh, really rich understanding of disease processes in that state. Now, exosomes themselves become biomarkers for disease, and you'll look at these for a number of fingerprints of disease that we can use, and they can be deployed to understand the traditional mutations that we see and derive from DNA, so KRAS, BRAF, EGFR, in different disease states, as well as a fingerprint of disease and that snapshot that I was alluding to. And so that becomes important because I think we can understand where these fit with regards to the uh, role that these play in that diagnostic and more strategy for monitoring space. And they both they can be deployed in, in those areas effectively. The other element is the circulating tumor cell biology component that uh, went from enumeration, which I mentioned before. So the counting of cells still be, is an important element for you know, that understanding of your disease prognosis. And the larger the number of cells of a cut point, the worse your status is and associated with more advanced stage and possibly non-response to standard therapy. So it becomes important to understand that that evolves over time to linking it up to molecular diagnostics. And I think that's where it becomes quite significant as we move that needle from just enumeration to really phenotyping and then characterization at the molecular level becomes quite important for that process. And so technologies that can do that and do it in an open way. And I think that gets at some of what I was alluding to with the cancer stem cell theories. 
that those are cells that will not have traditional cell surface markers like cytokeratin, so they can't be isolated that way. And they will have other properties associated with them that may be morphological properties as well as uh, pathway properties. And to dissect those effectively, isolate that cell population will require more open technologies that are being developed. And this is just an example of one of those that does it through a chip process and has methodologies where you can pop out different antibodies and be able to do this on a microfluidic chip where you can uh, evaluate the, the cell cells that you've isolated phenotypically. But then I think the beauty of taking this level from a phenotypic perspective and linking it to downstream uh, activities is quite important. So these become uh, relevant for us to understand the populations of cells that we're actually isolating and there's been uh, a number of publications on this that have moved that needle forward and it continues to progress and I think of importance uh, it will do that so that you will be able to understand and see what these uh, components mean. And they are clearly distinguished from the leukocytes and the general uh, blood population of cells. So they do exist, and then, then now it's a matter of further characterizing those for the future. And so we uh, here have uh, used the ion torrent platform in the hotspot in our clinical cancer sequencing element and to have a program on the liquid biopsy space that is linked to that is a very attractive element for us. And so that becomes a way from a clinical and a research lab piece that I mentioned during that, uh, the next gen pathology element to take uh, attributes that we're just beginning to understand from the circulating tumor cell space and evolve those to a platform that can, we can isolate the DNA from the circulating tumor cell, you can collect cell-free DNA from these systems, and you can also isolate genomic DNA. So now you get three attributes of that particular patient's material in one. You can visualize, you can phenotype, and now you can actually molecularly characterize. And from a flow perspective in a path department, as well as sort of phenotyping perspective, these become quite significant to do. And so there's a number of ways in which these approaches from the liquid biopsy space will evolve and will continue to evolve, and you'll see different platforms that will look at this. Sample stability and standardization become important in a clinical environment, and so getting the sample to us, these are non-tissue samples, so it's, uh, it is a bit tricky, and this is a, a group that actually fixes those samples, so we're able to then uh, be able to do that in a, a way that is quite robust and that allows us to the time from collection to analysis. There needs to be ways in which you could effectively not have contamination between samples and then I think you can read a number of the attributes here that are important in these processes and I think that drives a lot of these activities. So the, the game changer really is that use of these in decision processes becomes a very important component. There are challenges with these as you could imagine. I went through the whole process of tumoral heterogeneity so there you go. I mean this will be yet another attribute and all of those components from circulating tumor cells to exosomes to cell-free DNA will all play a role in that process. And that effective transition from CTC enumeration uh, to actual characterization will be critical. And then the ability to be able to do this in a robust uh, environment is important. Now, the other piece of that puzzle that uh, with the liquid biopsy is the cell-free DNA aspect. And the ability to look at that in the context of circulating tumor cells becomes important because you can then use two different physiologic mechanisms to derive an understanding of disease. And this uh, just gives you this in a cartoon fashion of what this looks like from the different attributes that are floating around in your blood and how they are actually derived is an important uh, aspect, whether they are butted off from populations of cells carried with uh, possibly immune-related activity, such as the circulating tumor cell piece, where they're shed from tumor cells by active growth and the change in the status of that cell population to a more mesenchymal or mobile cell, as well as then the cell-free DNA, which is apoptotic or ischemic and necrotic mechanisms or by direct extrusion from the cell if you are so inclined. So those are different ways in which you can actually get those attributes within the fluid and then how to exploit those. And then the last obviously is uh, emphasizing the exosome piece, which carries that whole complex DNA on the surface, but also has proteins and has rich microRNA and mRNAs of the transcriptome. So it, it plays yet a whole other level of understanding to what we're uh, trying to investigate. Genomics uh, obviously has the germline piece that helps us to understand the CTC and cell-free DNA components. 
And so that's important for the analytic side to be able to use the variants that are present within the germline and look at those and evaluate those in the context of the selfie DNA and the CTC DNA. So having the systems to be able to do this robustly and to create that analytic platform is a very important component of this. So we've gone into a number of act, uh, uh, activities with various folks, and one is uh, Sendenio, which looks at that ability. It's linked to the hotspot panel, but it also does it in a way that allows you to have somewhat of an open platform for phenotyping disease. And I think linking that to the, the hotspot allows you to get a very unique understanding of patients. And I'm not going to go into much detail here due to time, but looking at patients pre and post material, you can start getting a sense that this is pre-treatment and then post-treatment, that there are different mutations that are present in the pre-material that may not be present in the post-material, and that comparable mutations may be present in both the, the CTCs, which had the P53 mutation in this case, and then the selfie DNA has the same P53 mutation. So those concordant activities help to understand some of the roles that these play, but the discordant also helps to understand some of those roles in a, and lets you under, uh, really, I think, have an insight into the complexity that we're trying to process. So we are doing this in a, a triple negative breast cancer trial to drive some of these processes forward, to really push that envelope of understanding self-relating tumor cells, self free DNA, and, and then including uh, the natural killer cell activity through an ELISA assay as well. So again, you can bring in a fluid-based approach that crosses all avenues from the uh, genomic side that I've went through. You can then use exosomes in the context of this, as well as then looking at cell populations that may be very relevant with respect to understanding disease outcome and prognosis. So in uh, summary of what I've hopefully have convinced you that the genomic profiling of solid tumors is only one aspect of patient-specific phenotyping. And I think that that's an important element that uh, is missed. And I think it needs to be addressed. And it needs to be addressed at the protein level. It needs to be addressed at the RNA level. It needs to be addressed at the histomorphology uh, level. I think those become critical aspects of this. Pathology departments must adapt to become the true gatekeepers for precise medicine. We, we must, as pathologists, move this needle forward. Um, we are the gatekeepers. We, the ones, can decide um, that which assay should be performed for individual patients because we understand the elements and the underpinnings of the technology and how it can be deployed effectively in this space. That's my opinion. Liquid biopsy, I think, is a critical aspect of patient assessment, including exosomes, circulating tumor cells, proteomics, metabolomics, uh, all are aspects, to me, of the liquid biopsy space. It's not just the genomic component of this. I think it's all aspects of this are important. And that technologies that are robust, accurate, and demonstrate efficacy will advance this space uh, going forward and will continue to evolve this space as we go through. So what I see is the future, uh, you know, we have serum screening, you'll have your, the exosome biology piece as we see up top here with the circulating tumor cell piece as well as very relevant to understanding our activities and what we're trying to decipher. The proteomics element of that becomes very important as well as we bring in other components such as imaging. And I think imaging, especially in prostate cancer, with uh, the MRI and the use of really in directed uh, imaging will help to remove some of our sampling problems and get it uh, through molecular imaging more uh, targeted approaches for lesion assessment. And then overlaying that with, uh, as I went through, which was the systems pathology, precise pathology piece, using morphometry, using immunofluorescence or multiplex chromogenic attributes of cells uh, will add so much information to these activities and really decipher out the pathways that are actually turned on that we can understand and then impact on with a true therapeutic response. And I think that is the last slide, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Donovan, for bringing that important information to us. Before we get started on questions, I'm just going to remind our audience how they can submit their questions. Questions can be submitted by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing your question in the box. 
we'll be posing the questions to Dr. Donovan verbally, and he'll be able to follow along with the text and answer your questions. So our first question here comes from an attendee, and they ask, what role do you think learning about nutrient-dependent microRNAs and RNA-mediated cell type differentiation will play in differentiating between the molecular mechanisms of energy dependent healthy longevity and pathology that question is available for dr donovan to read through certainly i feel like uh, the RNA element and it's uh, how it's actually driven by the physiologic environment uh, that I think you're alluding to with this nutrient dependent microRNA aspect and the ability for microRNAs to modulate the genomic transcription level will become very, I think, are very important attributes that uh, I think difficult to dissect in the uh, human condition, but uh, certainly through. Uh, investigational approaches, I think, that will have tremendous insight into the, I think, understanding of what role that they play. But I do believe that RNA transcriptomics in general will be very important in our approach to phenotyping and medicine in general. Great. We have our we have our next question up in the box for Dr. Donovan. Which sample type is most appropriate for genomic profiling? Liquid biopsy, solid tumor, serum whole blood, saliva, or other body fluid? The biology department has been the solid tumor piece because that's the, the most accessible that is available for the majority of departments of pathology and even community practice settings. So you can do quite a bit with the, the formalin fixed paraffin embedded material in a genomic setting uh, and get reliable data from that. And uh, that, that can be effective because we would love to be able to have fresh frozen tissue uh, available to us. So the solid tumor, but at a fresh frozen level, would be better than the fixed tissue. It's just it's much more challenging to get that from the majority of the departments, pretty much in not only the US, but in Europe as well, and probably the world. So the, given that context, because I think that they serve uh, a very important role um, in understanding that. The liquid biopsy piece, certainly, you know, I, I'm a big believer in urine samples. And um, uh, we just had a, a publication, actually, in that in JAMA Oncology that looked at urine um, exosome biology with respect to prostate cancer. Um, and so I think that certainly you can isolate these uh, elements within fluids and derive some very valuable information from them. As we're seeing in urine, I think liquid biopsy material is also quite good. The complex body fluids are, I think, best uh, evaluated in the, in the context of some of the, the newer technologies that are of being able to look at phage display and be able to pull out specific elements within the, those, a, those aspects, but they are more complicated. And certainly saliva is also a rich source for exosomes. It's a rich source for DNA. It's a rich source for proteins. And there are a number of interesting publications that actually can uh, so have used that in uh, head and neck cancer and even lung cancer. So I think that there's ways in which uh, those become very important uh, aspects of our monitoring of disease, even at the early stage, potentially for screening of disease. Thank you, Dr. Donovan. That is all the time we have uh, right now for questions. I just want to pass it back to Dr. Donovan to see if he has any final comments for our audience today on his topic. The messages of where I believe the pathologist sits in this respect, the complexity of disease that we're facing, 
and that the ability to be able to deploy new technologies to look at this from a variety of perspectives will be so important as we try to derive our understanding of disease biology and outcome because really the end result is the patient and we need to be, I think, um, uh, understand what we say and how we say it with regards to some of our, uh, what our, I think are miraculous ways to be able to uh, impact on disease, but I think we need to really convey that in, in such a fashion that this is a complex process and we're sort of making, definitely making progress and headway, but we need to, I think, do more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Donovan. Certainly a lot of good information in your talk today. I want to thank Dr. Donovan for bringing this information to us and for taking time to make this presentation. I also want to thank labroots.com for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand replay through October of 2016. You'll receive an email from Labroots when this webcast is available for on-demand replay, and we invite you to forward that email to your colleagues who might have missed today's live event. Thank you again for logging on and being with us today. We hope we see you again. Goodbye. <laughs>